Britain's relationship with the United States has often been compared to that of a rebellious child leaving an overbearing mother. However, paradoxically, from an imperial perspective, I'd like to argue that Britain's loss of the American colonies was not a hindrance for the British, but instead the cause not only for Britain's imperial expansion, but also for its successful stability. When the 13 colonies declared their independence from Great Britain, they demonstrated their outrage over tax and suppression. King George III declared it an act of treason, issuing executions and demands for the suppression of the rebellion. But he was not wholly supported by his countrymen and parliament. Many in parliament at the time believed that the Americans had a point. The Americans were, after all, Englishmen, and therefore entitled to English liberties. As the famous politician Edmund Burke said to Parliament, the people of the colonies are descendants of Englishmen. They are therefore not only devoted to liberty, but to liberty according to English ideas and on English principles. The people are Protestants, a persuasion not only favourable to liberty, but built upon it. My hold of the colonies is in close affection, which grows from common names, from kindred blood, from similar privileges, and equal protection. In fact, his proposal to quell the revolution was much more consistent with democratic emancipation. He recommended that a general assembly should be created in British America to regulate taxes and partake in a degree of self-government. Yet when the Treaty of Paris was signed to end the American Revolutionary War in 1783, a lesson was learned. It seemed that a small island off the coast of Europe could not police its overseas territories with the sword. Henceforth, philosophy, politics and diplomacy would become the shield of the British Empire. When historians analyse the British Empire, they often break it up into at least two discrete historical bodies or polities. A first British Empire, existing prior to the American Revolution, and a second empire, existing post-American Revolution. The American Revolution had struck at the economic, geographical and political heart of the empire. The question is... How? Prior to the American Revolution, the empire had rested on the mercantilist notion that there was a finite amount of wealth and that a nation's strength and economic prosperity rested on restricting trade with other countries. For example, Britain had passed the Sugar Act in 1764 to raise duties and taxes on sugar bought from other nations, thereby keeping the sugar market in Britain's own economic zone. As such, the empire had built a strong Caribbean presence and welcomed the establishment of colonies along the North American coastline, a transatlantic empire which, theoretically, concentrated wealth in the motherland. This very same mercantilist worldview led to heightened taxes and prevented the American colonies trading with France and Spain, imposing duties on American goods and frustrating the American colonies, therefore helping contribute to the mantra of no taxation without representation. It is therefore perhaps ironic that the same year that the American Revolution began, Adam Smith published his famous book on the wealth of nations, arguing for free trade and a dismissal of mercantilism. The British Empire, in losing its American colonies, learnt a lesson to begin the adoption of freer trade, and although the empire did not immediately undergo this economic transition, the foundations were laid for a second British Empire with fewer tariffs. Yet the mantra of no taxation without representation was not wholly an economic argument, it was also political. As Burke had argued, the American colonists were Englishmen and therefore entitled to English liberties. For the Crown to deny them of those rights was, in his view, morally bankrupt, and it was quickly learned by those in Parliament that if another revolutionary episode was to occur, then military suppression, as used in the American Revolutionary War, would be ineffectual. However, the British did not wait for another rebellion to occur. They very quickly attempted to implement what they had learned from the loss of the newly found United States, and were better to do so than in the remaining loyalist territories of British North America, namely those which would become Canada. In 1837 and 1838, a series of rebellions kicked off amidst frustrations surrounding a lack of political freedom and democratic reform. In response, the British government commissioned the Liberal politician John Lambden as Governor General and High Commissioner of British North America. A progressive by the standards of the day, Lambden investigated the causes of these rebellions and produced a report which became known as the Durham Report. 
The report argued that whilst the present state of things is allowed to last, the actual inhabitants of these provinces have no security for person or property, no enjoyment of what they possess, no stimulus to industry. Lambden had considered that the colonists, having virtually no responsible government, had no means of changing their circumstances through rebellion. Lambden actually predicted that unless the northern colonists were granted responsible government, they would go the way of the United States, towards independence. It was hard to argue that the Canadian colonists were being rewarded for their loyalty to Britain, when the ever-growing United States was providing a better standard of political, economic and social well-being for its citizens. The example of the American Revolution became what to avoid, pushing the British government to confederate British North America into Canada and eventually giving it its self-government as a British dominion. This model would be followed in places like Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, giving way to an empire less so based on coercion and more so based on cooperation. The acclaimed historian Neil Ferguson, in his book Empire, described the British Empire as a liberal institution. It is, I suppose, paradoxical for an empire to be liberal, but when compared to the other European empires, his assessment is hard to disagree with. It is, however, not a coincidence that this liberal streak evolved in the aftermath of the American Revolution. A growing base of free trade and a growing belief in the need to spread the parliamentary system had pervaded the 19th century British Empire. That the American Revolution contributed to this is evident. However, what is well known is that the size of the empire grew tremendously in the 19th and 20th centuries, and its location also shifted. With the loss of the American colonies, and, it must be said, the diminished economic output of the Caribbean colonies, the British Empire underwent what some historians have called a swing to the east. India became the focus of the empire, and the now firmly held belief that British rule was a benevolent force which must be spread had become widespread. Imperialist factions sought to open new areas for trade, and when such areas were opened up, the area was placed on what the British believed to be a conveyor belt to responsible government. Gradually, throughout the early to mid-19th century, imperial trade moved away from the transatlantic belt towards Asia. True, the opening of the Suez Canal in the latter half of the 19th century and the development of newfound technologies certainly contributed to Britain's imperial focus. However, the loss of the American colonies was also the loss of surplus territory for the export of colonists and labourers. In a sense, Australia and New Zealand would come to supplement this need. It was almost as if British imperialists subconsciously sought to compensate for the loss of the United States by reordering the world. Geographic, economic and political, the American Revolution had a lasting effect on the British Empire. You could even say that it made it what it was.